Give her a hand. Um, those of you who know me personally know how uh, daunting this was for me. Um, for me, I work in the back of the house in a restaurant for a reason. And so thanks for being here and wanting to hear what I have to say. Um, the topic I chose uh, for the idea for the neighborhood is questioning the cult of convenience, which is just a way to put the way our culture moves with convenience these days can be really daunting, and I want to talk about it specifically uh, when it comes to food. Um, my whole career with food uh, started when I was 14, and it pushed me towards activism, um, wanting to know farmers, wanting to know where my food comes from. I grew up with a garden in the backyard, and I've gardened since I've been in my home. And it's just become one of those things that's so ingrained in me that I, I can't not talk about it to other people. Um, so starting from the point of the pandemic, which is where um, I got pushed to open La Bodega, um, I lost my job in the industry and it gave me a lot of time to think. Um, and the thoughts were mostly fear initially, which I think we all felt. Everyone was just collectively freaked out. Um, I was collectively freaked out for everyone in the service industry, in restaurants, in farming, in food, because, I mean, we were all washing our vegetables and bags of chips and everything was just so scary in that realm because you didn't know what was healthy for you and what wasn't. Um, and so all of that thinking and fear kind of subsided and it was like, okay, like if we're gonna come out of this on the other side, what would we want to do? Um, and so that led to <laughs> um, So uh, the restaurant I opened, um, if a lot of you have been there, a lot of you haven't, um, it's basically the way I devised to take my philosophies and the things I care about and put them into a business that would care for me and for my employees and for the community. Um, if you've been, you know the, uh, the hill I died on was having organic meat, which is really hard to do in the restaurant industry because the margins are really tough. Um, so it was uh, an odd science to figure out how everything would work financially to where people weren't feeling gouged and they were getting something that they knew was of value. Um, so this space gives me a platform that is not this public speaking platform, which stresses me out, um, but to engage with people and to engage with my community and talk about food and talk about where it's coming from and talk about who it's serving. Um, so that's a really big deal. Um, when we opened, the first questions that I was getting constantly were, why aren't you on delivery apps? Why don't you deliver? Why can't I do Uber Eats? And it was so daunting um, because, you know, like I built this thing for my community, like I want to meet the people that come in and, and have that space. And I, I went from like indifference of like, I've worked in places that have filled orders that way and things like that before the pandemic. Um, but it turned from like indifference, like, yeah, well, you know, I don't think we're gonna do that to like, absolutely, I'll never, never. <laughs> Um, and, and I always thought, you know, we're small, and so if I wanted to feature delivery, it would be like a pizza driver. Like, I will hire an employee that I know and care about, and that cares about my food, and how long it takes to get somewhere, and there will be quality delivered. Um, and so that whole thing has led me to, like, thinking through how heavily we rely on the convenience of our food these days and like whether or not it's fast food, but how it's getting delivered to us, how much is taken out of our interpersonal connections with the people that handle our food, which is also, you know, like I feel like people should care about. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move the slides here. Um, I might have gone too far. Nope, we're good. Um, these are just, you know, photos of my time in, um, in food activism and like eating with people that I care about. Uh, in 2013, I lost my mentor who was the first chef that ever hired me. 
Um, and he was a big unifier in our farm to table restaurant industry. Um, his name was Randall Copeland. And, um, and he passed away and it left this big hole in the broad Dallas farm to table community because so many of us, you know, people at restaurants, you know, McKinney, Richardson, whatever, but if you were a farm to table restaurant, you knew each other because your values were the same. We were using the same farmers. And um, so Randall used to host, like very casually, a Sunday supper at his house um, almost every week, maybe more like two times a month. And so it would just be a group of people that all cared about food and cared about community, and we'd cook a big meal together and sit down, and it was like, man, that was just the best thing. And when that went, it was like I lost all of that connection and that person. And so in 2013, I started doing um, dinners at my house, and it was just an open door policy, and I would um, cook a main and have everybody else potluck stuff in. And the, the principle of it was just like, hey, you know, like, let's everybody reconnect after all these things have happened, and you can bring anyone, and you, you know, like, open door. And it went, like, in two months, it went from being, like, 15 people showing up to, like, 40 to 50 people every single Sunday at my, like, tiny little house. So um, it was obvious that that's a thing that people crave, and the further we get from those types of scenarios, you know, where we're getting our food delivered, and it's no contact delivery. We don't even want to see the person's face who brought it. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this guy. Um, anybody else have a cabinet? Because you feel bad, because everything gets delivered in plastic, and you're like, I'll reuse it, and I'll give it away to somebody or whatever, but it's more than any of us could have ever, like. No one has storage for the type of stuff that we're getting because of convenience. Um, the, the scenario here is like, I know it's 2023. Like, we're busy. Most of us that are in this co-working space work for ourselves. Um, people have families. I'm not trying to be like, you should only, you know, whatever. But the scenario here is that if you're not thinking about it, if you're not questioning what you're doing, it, it's way too easy. And easy is, is a bad word when it comes to this stuff. It's, it's more of like the passion I've always had is letting people know that the harder you work or the harder a restaurant works to source where the food's coming from, to make it well, to care about you know, how far it traveled or how long you're keeping it in the restaurant before you serve it. Um, that is going to dictate the quality of it. It's going to dictate how you enjoy it. It's going to dictate how the person feels when they're making it. Um, and so if we're not questioning how easy things are to get, then it just becomes commonplace. And you have every app on your phone and you get stuff delivered everywhere. And so, you know, with La Bodega, it's been this whole conversation that I've been able to have of, you know, like, no, we don't do delivery, and there's a reason, and we're right in the neighborhood, and I want it to be very specific to where we are. I've seen small businesses get on those apps, and quality goes to crap, and people's morale is tanked because they're so busy that you can't, you can't maintain a work-life balance anymore, and like that was not the goal in opening a small business in a small community. Um, so... Before I did this talk, um, I reached out to Eric over there because I was like, oh, I'm so stressed, I can't pick a topic, and I know our values align with food, and, and that's one of the things um, concerning not only local small businesses that care about this stuff, right, but the time and the energy and the information that you get if you know a grower or you grow your own food. There's something so punk rock about picking what you want to grow, growing it yourself, harvesting it, cooking with it, and feeding friends with it. Like there's, it's everything that you want only your way. Like it's so, so cool, dude, it's so cool. Um, and having a garden like we have with Elmwood Farms in the community where you can also participate with the waste that you make, hopefully from cooking at home, right? Because cooking at home is a good thing. 
Um, all of that, like going back in to the soil in our neighborhood, growing food, it's just, it's one of those things that's like up here for me about what is a healthy community, especially in modern day conveniences. Um, so this is just a nice little list of, uh, you know, go to, go to your local farmer's market and buy produce from people that grow it or, you know, grow food at your house and then trade it with neighbors. Um, and all that to say, um, the, the best way to tackle this convenience issue in my mind is more community because we are all busy. So it's like, okay, like I'm not telling you cook every meal and I'm not telling you that you have to go sit down and eat in, in a restaurant and spend that money and, and do all of that. But the, the things that I would say to do would be cook with people, cook often, share leftovers. Um, you know, like you make a big pot of something, walk it over to a neighbor and then they'll do the same for you. And I mean, we live in a tight knit community for a reason, you know, um, and doing these things not only makes your life better and it takes effort and work, which is good for us. Um, but it helps us just take time and prioritize things that aren't that convenient, but that are way better for us in the long run. That's it. Questions awesome. Great. You guys have any questions? Follow up? Starts off there. Can I ask how you settled on the uh, style of cuisine for La Bodega? The style of cuisine for La Bodega is pretty much the food that I eat every day. So I, it was really easy in the sense of, um, I remember when I was in my 20s, I wanted to open my own place and I felt so daunted. Um, like I needed to do research and, and find out, you know, what the market wanted and, and what I was good at cooking. And at that age, like at, I think I was 21 when I wanted to do that. So at that age, I wasn't good at cooking anything. I was, you know, um, two years out of culinary school, I guess. Um, but deciding to open a place at 35 was like, oh, this is easy. I've done this forever. I cook all the time. Like I know how to make all the things that I like. I know what I think tastes good. I think um, I know what's different for people, you know, like when they, when they come into La Bodega and are seeing things on the menu that they're like, oh, I don't think I would have done it that way. It's like, well, I do it that way all the time and I know it's good, <laughs> you know. So, um, so yeah, it really was. And the, the inspiration for the specific concept itself came from um, two things that I just thought were so smart. And one was while I was traveling in um, southern Spain in 2019, I was traveling with somebody who wasn't an eater, which is a nightmare, so don't, I don't recommend. <laughs> um, but so it was like every night I would be like, hey, I've got like, you know, anywhere from five to 10 places I wanna go eat tapas. And then this person would go with me and watch me eat. And then we would come home to the apartment we were staying at and there was this little place around the corner that just sold rotisserie chicken and french fries. Mm. And that's what he would eat every single night. And I was just like, but I was like, that's actually kind of cool. <laughs> I was like, it's, you know, it's a good neighborhood concept because we were in a neighborhood, you know? And I loved that it was just this thing tucked away there. And then there's a really cool concept in San Francisco called uh, Suvla. And I've been eating there for 15 years, I think, may, maybe a little less. Um, but it's a, it's a Greek, so Mediterranean concept that does all of, they do a bunch of different meats that are spit roasted, but then they do them on sandwiches or in wraps. And um, one of the big things for me too concerning food is uh, waste. I hate, I hate waste, which is another reason it took me a long time to open a restaurant because restaurants waste food. Um, and that's why Bodega is so small, and that's why everything is so fresh. Uh, we, I mean, we have to get deliveries every other day, and we prep everything every other day. So we're not like over prepping something, and then it gets to a point where we, I'm like, oh, we can't sell it. Like that doesn't happen. Like we'll run out of it before I throw it away. You know. So, um, so yeah, all those things like fresh food and Mediterranean style is what is so familiar to me. It made sense for that to be the concept. Yeah. 
Uh, I'd love to hear some wisdom about how to, uh, well, the idea of doing things that you're describing, I feel anxiety about the money and the time, <laughs> what investment it takes. So any wisdom for organizing a life that would help us have like a Sunday supper or something like that? Yeah. Gosh, you know what's funny is I, I remember, I think I talked to you about it, Bill. Um, Bill here is my neighbor and, and has participated in many Sunday suppers of, as have a few others. Um, but like, let me tell you, the truth of the matter is when I was doing these Sunday suppers, I was 25 when they started. I was making $20,000 a year. And every week I would spend a reasonable amount of money preparing a main dish for 40 people. And, but then I ate for free all week because there were leftovers and everyone brought everything and everyone went home with stuff. And I never felt it. I never felt it in my pocketbook. It was like, oh, like, yep, I'm good. You know, like saw people, spent time, good connections. And, and most of my friends, most of the, the way I interact with people is cooking and eating. I mean, we, like my closest girlfriends are all people who like ferment and garden and you know like it, it's so much fun and it's so weird and we're doing stuff other people aren't doing when we get together you know what I mean like it's fun so I think it sounds more daunting than it really is and a potluck especially you know that takes a lot off your plate I am um, I am hospitable but I am not a host so like my house gets open and I am so happy to have people, but I don't want to be in charge of anything after that. And that, that's always how Sunday suppers ran. I'd be like, hey everybody, here's what I'm making. It's not a theme. You don't have to bring anything specific. I don't care. Just show up, not empty handed, and then we'll all eat food and it'll be fine. <laughs> and then I'll kick you out when I'm tired. So, um, so yeah, and I mean, you know, like here, and, and it's, I mean, with Doug and Grant, like it's been so nice to be part of this even though I was just lamenting to Grant that like with the restaurant, my schedule has gotten so weird and I have a membership here because I still have the day job. Um, and so usually when I'm here working, it's for my day job, but my schedule has been so upside down at the restaurant that I've started working from home more because I have to take care of home matters while I'm working my day job because otherwise it won't get done because I'm at the restaurant at night. And, um, but here, the space, you know, like you guys host lots of great stuff that brings people together and often over food. And I'm so bummed I'm going to be out of town for the Thanksgiving. I loved Thanksgiving last year. Um, and so I think it's just making, making those priorities for, I mean, like at the end of the day, right, people are selfishly motivated and that's not an unhealthy thing. So at the end of the day, do it for yourself because it's healthier for you. And then it's healthier for your family if you have, you know, a, a nuclear family, and it's healthier for your community and your relationships with people to share those things with them. Yeah. So I have a question about the sourcing of meats. Mm -hmm. I'm originally from Germany, so when Love I it. go to my butcher, <sighs> it actually has a picture <laughs> of the cow on the wall. Yeah with the name of the farm, when it was born, how it lived, who the mother and the father were. I have a direct connection to any Portlandia piece, over there, yeah. <laughs> to any piece of meat or food and the sacrifice that was made by that animal for me to eat it. And I have the hardest time here yeah. To, so when you're talking organic meats, my ears perked up because I do know how to do that with vegetables. Yeah. But I don't quite know how to do that with well, in, meats. And in the States, it's a lot harder, right? And that, I think that might be why. Um, I mean, I've always had a passion for travel and seeing the way the food industry works outside of our country is inspirational and then being here is scary um, and so organic meat is one of those things where like I mean I don't I, I've never made a lot of money in, in in my career and I've been fine with that but it's one of those things that it it has to be a priority for you to want to spend the extra money on it because it does cost more um, and so for me like 
I'm not that diligent about other things, right? Like I buy organic berries because they spray the crap out of those, y'all. And I buy organic meat and organic milk and organic eggs, right? So animal products. Um, but like for the restaurant, for example, I really, really wanted to use some of the local farmers that I used at past restaurants I worked at. Um, I wanted pasture-raised chicken. Um, but pa the, the pasture-raised game has changed. And those birds were going to be like $9 a pound. Oh, wow. And I was like, well, there's no way to pass that on no. to people. Like, I can't charge $80 for a bird, and I would never buy it, and it's insane. So it was like not an option. Um, and so for me, it was like, okay, second best thing. And I asked a bunch of chefs in my community that care about sourcing and where their food comes from, and I got the same answer from all of them, which is the place I get my chicken from is in the Pennsylvania Dutch country. It's like a third generation poultry farm. And, um, and they have like the cleanest practices in the industry and like good animal husbandry. And so it's like, okay, like that's how I can do it. It's not exactly how I wanted to do it. <laughs> but it's how I could do it for this concept. As far as getting your meat here, you know, like we have a few butchers around. I haven't really spent much time going to Cooper's. I think it's just a little out of my price range. I don't know, but I do know a lot of people that go regularly. Burgundy is a local farm that I've used in restaurants that they have a little space over on uh, Ross Avenue. And they have like, they have good, like rabbit is one of my favorite meats and they have rabbit, they have things that would be less expensive that you, you know, you might like and, and price differently. And the concern for me is always all those antibiotics and all this other stuff that ends up yeah. in meat here because when I came to this country, I started developing food allergies like crazy yeah. um, because my body wasn't. Used yeah, I was like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> That's not food. It's illegal where I come from. So, yeah. Um, that's yeah, it had to be a big culture shock for sure. Yeah, so that's why I was interested because it also has a major impact on flavor. Yeah, oh yeah. I think too, I mean, like if, if you have the time and energy, like in, investing time to go to local farms and make relationships with people yeah. that are doing, because we have a lot, you know, within two hours of us in Texas, people that have goats and sheep, um, it, you're, it's going to be less, like if somebody is raising cattle, it's going to be cattle, you know, and I eat very little red meat, but, um, but yeah, it's, I think it's more relational. Like you want to know your butcher, you want to know your farmer. Yeah. yeah if that's a priority. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say if it, it's a hard commitment for people, I think, because it's your weekends, you know, and I, I think most people grocery shop on the weekends. But um, but I mean, farmers markets like that's a really easy way for like what's in front of your face to purchase is in season, you know, but it's hard. And I, I understand this because my my boyfriend um, he has he has ADHD and grocery shopping is like a, he has to have a list or he cannot like he'll be too scattered when he goes in. He's like, I can't do it. Um, and so, you know, for me, I'm like, I can open my pantry and like go pick something outside and be like, oh, you know, it's a meal. But that's 20 years. Right. Like that's that's 20 years of just randomly making meals, you know. And so it can be harder if that is not your training to be like, oh, look at that vegetable. I know what I'll do with that. But I think it is, it's fun, you know, like it's, it's being a little more adventurous, it's trying new things. So if you were to go to the farmer's market, you know, try one or two things that you've never cooked before, you know, just be like, okay, like I'll take these home. And I mean, your best bet with a vegetable, roast it. Roasted vegetables, y'all. I mean, that's all you have to do to them. They're delicious. Um, but you know, cause then we have the internet at our fingertips, right? So get your two vegetables, go home, be like recipe with rutabaga, recipe with, you know, whatever. And then you have, you know, a plethora of options. Good. Any other questions? 
Let's let's give Sky another round of applause. Woo!